Welcome to GCN's big Vuelta preview show. I can't believe we're at this point already. It's the final Grand Tour of 2019. Coming up, all you need to know about the route and the key riders. Yes, indeed. And as many of you will know, the Vuelta actually used to be the first Grand Tour of the season and take place in the spring. Uh, but it's now cemented its position in the latter part of the year and comes about four weeks after the Tour de France. Uh, speaking of which, just like the Tour, we're going to have daily highlights for you, which we'll put up as soon as we possibly can after each and every stage. Uh, they will be over on our GCN Racing YouTube channel and available wherever you are in the world, which we're quite excited about. Yeah, very much indeed. So if you haven't already subscribed, make sure you go over there and do that. And while you're at it, hit the bell icon so that you're notified every time we upload a new video. We've got loads coming up in September, including the Tour of Britain, where you'll be able to see Matthew van der Poel trying to hone his form ready for the upcoming World Championships in Yorkshire at the end of the month. Yeah, it's a busy old month, actually, isn't it? Uh, back to the matter in hand, though, the Vuelta a España, which these days is often the hardest Grand Tour of the year, given the brutal route that the organisers choose and also the ferocious heat that the riders often have to deal with. Uh, this year, it all kicks off this coming Saturday, the 24th of August, in Salinas de Torrevieja, uh, down in southern Spain near Alicante. Uh, it is 3,272 kilometres in length and the 21 stages are broken down as follows. Uh, it starts with a team time trial, there's one individual time trial. There are six flat stages. Four... Oh, those are Spanish flat stages Yes, yeah, yeah, well. six <laughs> flat stages, then four hilly stages, but nine days in the high mountains. Yes, although this one is shorter than both the Giro and the Tour with more days in the high mountains, a lot of riders use this it can be the one, if your season hasn't quite gone to plan, you come to the Vuelta. But given that, with both Chris Froome and Tom de Moulin out of action, that's not yeah. really the case this year. And traditionally as well, some teams use this one, where they give their young stars that sort of first Grand Tour start. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because although the stages can be quite brutal, uh, it's a lot more relaxed than a race such as the Tour de France, which is in essence a big pressure cooker. Uh, so it's the perfect place, really, for a young rider to find their Grand Tour legs. Isn't it? Indeed, and last year it was Simon Yates who you'll remember learned from his mistakes at the Giro d'Italia really came out fighting in Spain and in the end he came out with that record which was pretty good for the Brits it was the first time that all three Grand yeah. Tours in the same year had been won by three different riders from the same country yeah. hasn't quite been like that for the Brits this year though has no, it? not so much <laughs> Right then, let's take a look at the key stages of this year's route. As I mentioned, it all kicks off this Saturday. That is the team time trial down in Torrevieja. 13.4 uh, kilometres long, so it's not that long in distance, but still long enough to potentially see time gaps of up to 30 seconds, we think, even amongst the GC favourites. And as we all know, team time trials can be crucial because any time you lose there, can come back to haunt you later in the race. Yeah, definitely. 2017 was the last time that we opened with the team time trial test. On that time, it was won by BMC. Now, we'll come on to the favourites later, and there's been quite a lot of changes in teams since then. But on that occasion, Sky lost six seconds, Mitchelton Scott lost 17, Movistar 24, but I, quite interestingly, Jumbo Visma lost 40 seconds. They did, although this year they've been absolutely stomping the team time jars, haven't they? I think they'll start the race as favourites on Saturday. Uh, after that, we've got three stages which skirt up the coast of Spain. We think they are probably going to finish in bunch sprints, but you can never be sure at the world, sir. Uh, after that, though, we've already got the first mountaintop finish on day five. And what a stage it is. Starting in Liliana, it heads inland before finishing with a brute of a climb to the Havalandra Observatory. It's 12 kilometres in length, but the last eight kilometres averages 10%. It's a real classic welter stage, that one, isn't it? I'm really <laughs> looking forward to it. Uh, that one, although it comes early in the race, I think it's going to give us a good indication, actually, as to who could win the race this year. Yeah, definitely. And as we all know, in a Grand Tour, it's about finishing the three weeks on peak form rather than having it right at the beginning. And especially at this time of year, you're kind of walking that sort of form, fitness and health uh, sort of tightrope, yeah. um, which, you know, the wheels can come off at any time. Yes. Uh, stages six and seven are also very well to opening week-esque. Uh, stage six is a hilly one, and that finishes up the Alas de Masterat. And then stage seven finishes on the Alta Master Costa, uh, which is an interesting one. It's only 3.8 kilometres long, but it averages 10%, and there are gradients within that climb of 21%. Yeah, and these sort of short, sharp finishing climbs can sometimes be more exciting than a mountain top finish, even though that we, we love those, because coming into these, riders feel that they can just smash it yeah. from the bottom, rather than kind of biding their time and waiting to sort of three to five kilometres from the top to, to 
sort of really make their move. Yeah, it's what makes the Worlds so special, isn't it? <laughs> uh, stage eight, we think, is another one for the sprinters to shine. Stage nine is the last one before the first rest, isn't it? But what a stage that is. I think when they see the profile, the sprinters' eyes are already going to be watering, aren't they? Only 94.4 kilometres long, but it starts on a Cat 1 climb, and it's brutal throughout, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. We've got the sort of especial climb of the Col de Galina right in the middle. Before what comes like a, it's almost like a staircase of Cat 2 climbs with sort of no real descent in between. And then we climb up to sort of 2,095 metres right up to that summit finish. Yeah, definitely one for your diaries, that one. Uh, the following day, they will have that rest day in France, actually, because they travel up towards Po, which is where the stage 10 individual time trial finishes. Coincidentally, the same place where we had the time trial at the Tour de France this year. Uh, it is around 39 kilometres in length, uh, but it's pretty flat, this one, but still long enough to see some pretty big time gaps between the riders. Yeah, definitely. And it's the only individual time trial in this year's of Welton. When you look at it, you know, as you said, it's, it's flat, unlike the Tour de France. You've got to look at someone like Primoz Rogge, who potentially could put a serious amount of time into his rivals in this one. Now into week two, we're uh, gonna have a much better idea on who needs to attack in the mountains to regain any time that they lost in the time trial. And if the Tour and the Giro are anything to go by, we seem to be seeing this kind of seismic shift in the way the climbers are really going about their business. That's right, yeah. Uh, less defensive and more aggressive, which is great for us as TV spectators, really, isn't it? Uh, stage 11, we head back into Spain. That one's 180 kilometers long. And for me, the stage profile has breakaway written all over it because it's got a couple of Cat 3s and one Cat 2. And actually, stage the following day into Bilbao is also, I think, one for the breakaway. Yeah, definitely. So stages 13, 15 and 16 are all summit finishes, but the well Walter is pretty famous for seeking out some of the steepest climbs in world cycling. Previous welters, of course, the Anglerou being one of them. And while that's not in the race this year, we head to Los Machucos, which is 7.3 kilometers in length with maximum gradients of 28%. Yeah. Yes. You heard me right, 28%. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? And actually, some of you that have watched previous Vuelta preview shows here on GCN uh, will know that that climb locally uh, is described as rampas inhumanas, which is basically inhumane ramps, which is the perfect description, really, with 28% gradients. I mean, this thing's so steep that in places there are concrete slabs instead of uh, the mm. usual tarmac. And it's also really narrow. There are points where you can really only fit two riders side by side up it. And when you add in the spectators that will be on the side of the road, it's going to be quite spectacular by all accounts, isn't it? Also, the team's going to have to be doing some planning for that particular stage because we don't think team cars are going to be allowed up that final climb. Moving on, two more summit finishes to the Alto de Acebo and the Alto de la Cubilla, 11 and 27 kilometres long, respectively. Is that it? Yeah. Just glossing over them like, yeah, two more mountain <laughs> stages. There's just so many of them, aren't there? I think we'd be in for about a month otherwise. Yes, probably right. <laughs> uh, the final rest day is in Burgos, and then the day after that, stage uh, 17, I think it is, uh, is another sprinter's affair. It goes from Burgos to Guadalajara, uh, 220 kilometres long. And then stage 18 is actually the penultimate day, really, for the GC riders to try anything in the overall classification. It's another beast, 180 kilometres long, roughly, with four Category 1 climbs en route. Yeah, and then we go into stage 20 from Arenas to San Pedro, the Plataforma de Gredos. We have the Cat 1, Puerto de San Pedro, right out of the blocks, followed swiftly by a couple of Cat 2s, a Cat 3, a long descent. We then have the Cat 1, Puerto de Pena Negra, a whole bunch of uncategorized climbs before a Cat 3 climb to the finish. Yeah. In short, the route is horrific if you're a non-climber, isn't it? Uh, essentially, though, whoever is standing on the podium after that stage in the red jersey as leader of the race has won it, basically, yeah. because the final stage finishes in Madrid. It's completely flat and won for whoever the sprinters have managed to make it through that far. Yeah, you're going to have a huge amount of respect for any sprinter yeah, that's made it so. this far. Well, that's the route. Let's uh, have a look at who we think is going to be up there. Before we get on to those favourites, uh, bear in mind that we are recording this about 10 days before the race starts. So we have a provisional start sheet, but we're not 100% sure exactly who's taking no. part. But we are pretty sure that Primoz Roglic is going to be there. And I think we have to start with him as the top favourite, don't we? Uh, he did start as the top favourite for the Giro d'Italia back in May. And after his performance in that opening time chart in Bologna, many people were speculating as to whether he could hold on to the lead from start to finish. 
We all know that now didn't play out in the end due to various factors, but you wouldn't bet against him taking his first Grand Tour here at the Welter. Yes, indeed. It's worth noting that this is his first Welter start. Beyond the national championships, this is his first big race start since the Giro. Yeah. But who knows, that freshness could be just what he needs. And he's also going to have his teammate Stephen Kreisweig here as well, who comes off the back of a really strong third place at the Tour de France. And while we're not sure whether he'll have GC aspirations in this race. That they're going to be a really strong partnership. Well, he might have aspirations, might he? Because mm. there are plenty of examples of riders doing really well on the GC on back-to-back -back Grand Tours in the modern era. Uh, but we'll wait and see. Uh, the other big favourite has to be the man that actually did win the Giro d'Italia this year, and that is Richard Carapaz of Team Movistar. Uh, now, he will start in probably the strongest team on paper in terms of the general classification contenders. Uh, again, we haven't seen much of him since the Giro d'Italia. He has started the Barta Burgos, which is on as we speak, so we don't know what his form is like there. But a sensible decision, I think, to go to that race before the Vuelta, because when you've had a break as long as that from racing, it can be a bit like getting an engine going in an old car when it hasn't been used for a long time, can't it? You need to get it up and running and give it a run out before it's on top performance again. Yeah, definitely. And Carapaz, he just seems like that sort of rider that just needs a little bit of competition before he comes into mm. a big objective. Alongside him, we'll of course have another former winner in world champion uh, Alejandro Valverde and also Naira Quintana. Yeah, another former so, winner, yeah. Yeah, another former winner. And, you know, for Naira Quintana, it seems like he's had enough of the, the multiple leader scenario at Movistar and, uh, you know, from recent reports, he's off to past his new next year at Arkea Samsung. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't see that going very well. I no. wish him all the best. How will he do at the Welter? Could he finish his contract at Movistar with a win? Well, you wouldn't put it past him, would you? If he can recreate the form that saw him take that amazing stage of the Tour de France, which I think we all absolutely love watching, he's going to be a very hard man to beat, isn't he? Yeah, definitely, unless his teammates flick him. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> another former winner who's here is uh, Fabio Aru, and uh, he's another rider that's looking to try and rediscover the sort of form that had him tipped as, as one of the next big Grand Tour riders of his generation, and really, for poor Fabio, things never really no. went to plan. And, and then this year, he was diagnosed as having a constricted iliac artery. He had surgery in April. He then came back, he finished 13th at the Tour de France, just kind of quietly going about his business and just sort of getting back to that form. Yeah. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll see a glimpse of the uh, the Fabio Aru of old. Well, the good thing about that diagnosis for Aru was the fact that it actually gave him a reason why he wasn't performing at mm. his best. Uh, so I'm sure he'll take a lot from that. And actually, a rider who will be teammates with Aru next year at UAE Team Emirates is Davide Formula, currently with Bora Hansgrohe. Now, much was expected of him many years ago. His performance at the 2015 Giro d'Italia was so spectacular at a young age, we expected him to be a big Grand Tour contender in future mm. years. He has finished before ninth at the World Series and twice 10th at the Giro d'Italia, but I'm just not expecting him to be right up there on GC this no. year again, even though he's finished second at Liège, Baston Liège to uh, Jakob Fulsang and took a spectacular stage win at the Volta Catalunya. I don't think he's got it. No. Yeah. The other rider, what about Esteban Chavez? I mean, who doesn't love this guy? I yeah. absolutely, I'm a massive fan of him. I mean, he's, he's a battler, he's a fighter, he's come back from illness and injury again and again. He's got two Grand Tour podiums to his name, remember? He's been second at the Giro, yeah. he's been third here as well. And, you know, at the end of 2017, he was diagnosed with the Epstein-Barr virus and he won that Mount Etna stage of the 2018 Giro and he didn't race again for the rest of the year. No, no, he has come back from adversity quite a few times, hasn't he, Esteban Chavez? And I don't think there was a single cycling fan that didn't enjoy him, uh, watching him win stage 19, I think it was, of the Giro d'Italia to San Martino di Castrozza. Just seeing that familiar smile across <laughs> his face and the elation and the sort of traditional Chavez family embrace after the finish line was absolutely magical. Again, I, I don't see him fighting for the podium positions this year, but I would love to see him take a stage win. Yeah, he's so popular, eternally positive. Now, another Colombian is Rigoberto Urán, who, of course, finished seventh at the Tour de France. And we're not sure if he's here with GC ambitions for the EF Education First team as well. They had Danny Martinez, yeah. who they we thought would come here as maybe a rider that they would protect, 
but he had to pull out of the Tour of Utah after crashing in training and breaking his wrist and his finger. So as we record this, his sort of participation is now a bit in mm, doubt. Seems unlikely mm. with a broken wrist uh, that close to the welter. Uh, also in that team, we think, uh, is the Brit Hugh Carthy, who will come off the back of a very, very strong performance at the Giro d'Italia, where he finished in 11th place overall and really impressed on multiple stages, didn't he? Uh, I'll always remember also that Tour de Suisse stage that he won this year, which was absolutely epic. He's a rider also that is not afraid to go on long, quite flamboyant, long-range attacks, is he? So I'm expecting him to light the world up this year. Also, there's the fact that he started his pro career with the pro-continental Spanish team Jaja Rural, uh, and he lives in Pamplona in Spain, so effectively, this is his home race. Yeah, definitely. Now, the other rider that I'm expecting big <coughs> things from is uh, Tade Pogacar. Yes. yes. Now, uh, when you look at him, just 20 years old, is he the young dark horse of this one? And if you look at the successes that he's had, races such as Tour of California, it kind of follows a sort of similar pattern to Egan Bernal. And is he too young at 20? But when you look at the likes of Remco Evenepoel and Egan Bernal this year, is anyone too young anymore? We seem to be seeing this massive generation shift yeah. this year. No, nobody seems too young. I'm sure we'll have our first 17-year-old Grand Tour win in the next few years. Uh, we've also got Rafael Maika, who's at the other end of his career. He's 29 years of age now. So it's actually been a couple of years since he last took uh, a win anywhere, in fact. But by coincidence, it was at the Vuelta in 2017. Uh, there, he beat Miguel Angel Lopez. But again, he's not a rider that's in his ascendancy, is he? He just seems to have plateaued, in fact, gone slightly downhill in form. Yeah, he kind of looked like he was coming back at the Tour of the Alps. And another rider kind of like that is Wilco Kelderman. Mm. And, and Wilco, again, he's a rider that, that promised much a few years ago, and he's kind of always there and thereabouts. So we'll, you know, we'll see with him. Yes, we shall see. Uh, amazingly, we've got almost to the end of our list of GC contenders and haven't yet mentioned Team Ineos. Uh, nice. Really rare that they go into any Grand Tour without a genuine contender for the win. It's happened twice this year. Firstly, at the Giro d'Italia, courtesy of the fact that Egan Bernal crashed before it and didn't take part. Yeah, that was my curse, by the way. Yes. I predicted him, didn't I? And then again <laughs> here at the Vuelta. Now, Theo is a part of their Giro d'Italia team, Theo Gegenhardt, supremely talented young British rider. He must have been devastated when he crashed out midway through the race, because I'm sure he must have thought that was his opportunity to shine gone without a big team leader. However, he's got that same opportunity to shine here, because there's no clear team leader for Team Ineos here either. And given how he's been racing this year, I'm expecting pretty big things from him. Yeah, definitely looked great at the Tour of the Alps, didn't he? A slight interlude from Tapper's revolution in Bath because Aston R have just released their official roster for the Welter and it is a formidable one to say the very least. Uh, podium finisher last year, Miguel Angel Lopez will lead the team alongside one of the men of 2019 so far, Jakob Fulsang. Uh, they'll be backed up by the likes of Jon Izaguirre and Luis Leon Sanchez. So that, along with Movistar, look to be the strongest teams in the race. Race. Watch out for them. Also, another Colombian, Sergio Higuita of EF Education First, looks to be riding his first Grand Tour too. He could really upset the apple cart. Anyway, back to Marty and Lloydie. Right, on to the sprinters and the Vuelta. Given how tough it is, it's uh, it's usually quite light on the fast men. Yeah, well, I think the sprinters <laughs> look at the stage profiles and are put off immediately, aren't they? But that said, this year, we've got one of the best sprinters from this season on the start line in the form of Sam Bennett of Bora Hansgrohe. As we record this, he's just taken three back-to-back -back stages at the Binkbank Tour in Belgium. And he's basically been on fire since the start of the season, really. I think yeah. his first win came at the Tour de San Juan back in January. Uh, he has 11 victories to his name to date. We don't know who he's going to be riding for yet next year. It won't be Bora Hansger, but what we're pretty sure about is that he's going to add to his victory tally here at the Welter. Yeah, he always has great form at the end of the season. Now, another rider, John Degenkolb, he won 10 stages of the Welter between 2010 and 2015. He got left out of the Trek Segafredo team for the Tour de France. He has just one win to his name so far this year at the Tour de la Provence. He's got close on multiple occasions. And again, he's another rider who we're not quite sure where he's going next year, whether he's gonna trade with uh, Trek Segafredo or he's off to, to Pastures News. So whatever happens, a win here at the Vuelta would go a long way. Well, it would do, yes. Uh, there's also fellow German from Team Sunweb, Max Valscheid. 
Cast quite an imposing figure in the spring yeah. finish, doesn't he? Because he's almost two metres tall. Yeah, slightly taller than me. <laughs> yeah, um, he's <laughs> had four second places this year, no wins. He's taken some reasonable wins in the past, but nothing that we'd really call huge. But potentially, the Vuelta Espana might be his chance to shine on the big stage. Yeah, definitely. And the man that beat Big Max at Schelder Prize was Fabio Jakobsen, who at just 22 is the Koenig Quickstep sprinter here. Now, he's going to have the blue train at his disposal here at the Vuelta in whatever form that takes. And it doesn't seem to matter. They just seem to live a charmed life, yeah, doesn't it? When it, when it does when it comes to winning. And he's had a great season, including that Dutch national championship. So I think the icing on the cake really would be that first Grand Tour stage win in his first Grand Tour. And then we've also got Luca Mezgec from Mitchelton Scott. Now, for the past couple of years, he's primarily been on lead-out duties and domestic duties, but in the Tour of Poland recently, uh, he proved that he can still win at the very top level. He took two stage wins there, one of which was at warp speed, wasn't it? One of the fastest recorded sprints ever. I think he clocked just over 81 kilometers per hour there, which is quite incredible, even though it was on a slight downhill. Uh, now, he has won a stage of the Giro in years gone by, and I think it might be time for him to add a welter stage to his collection. Yeah, definitely, mind-blowing that sprint. Now, another fast man out there is Fernando Gaviria, and he, of course, had to withdraw from the Giro with a knee injury. He, won he did win a stage there. Mm. He came back, but he then came up again, Pascal Ackerman and Luka Miesgitz in Poland, where he finished second on a couple of occasions. Now, it's not been the best year, really, uh, first year with UAE Team Emirates since leaving De Koenig Quick Step. So I think that team will be hoping that he can just rediscover that form mm. maybe with a morale boosting Vuelta stage win before he's reunited with his lead out man, Max Rochese, next yeah. year. So it's actually quite a decent lineup of sprinters for this year's Vuelta, isn't it? So the flat stage will be very exciting too. Uh, beyond the sprinters and GC rides, we've also got the likes of Thomas de Gent doing his third Grand Tour of the season. So expect to see him in breakaways on most days. <laughs> uh, and then there's also potentially Philippe Gilbert for De Koenig Quick Step. Again, we don't know exactly where he's going to next year in terms of team. And also he might be primarily at this race to prepare for the World Championships in Yorkshire. Yeah, and it might sound strange, but you, you also get that whole sort of group of riders that are preparing for next year's Spring yeah. Classics. So it's something that a lot of riders whose sort of big objectives end in April, coming to the Vuelta and getting that big volume and high intensity racing going into to the winter can just be the sort of groundwork for a great spring classic yeah, season. It just puts you into the winter on that slightly higher level of form, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, right then, those are the sprinters, those are the other riders, those are the GC contenders. So now it's time to make our predictions. Oh. Confident with Roglic? Yeah, definitely. I've known Primoz for quite a few years. First met him at the Tour of Azerbaijan years ago, and I know I bore quite a few people to tears <laughs> with, with that fact. But yeah, his time is now. It does feel like it's only a matter of time before he wins his first Grand Tour, but it won't be the Vuelta because no. Pogacar has got this one sealed, in my opinion. I'm kind of joking, of course, he's young, he's never done a Grand Tour before, but he is just so supremely talented. And as you mentioned earlier, 2019 seems to be the year of a new generation. I definitely think he's got what it takes. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see him on the podium at the end of this race. No, not at all. And it's worth mentioning that Dan did predict that Egan Bernal was going to yes, win the Tour de France, ended mentioning. the GCN curse, and he doesn't let us forget that fact as well. No. Makes us pay homage to him every morning. Right then, uh, let us know who you think is going to win this year's Vuelta Espana in the comments section below. I have no doubt uh, that you will do a better job than us with that yeah. respect. Feel free to berate us in four weeks' time if we're predictably wrong. My prediction for the Vuelta, Alejandro Valverde. Primoz Roglic. My prediction for this year's Vuelta is Primoz Roglic to take the win. You will notice that during the show, we have been sporting some Spanish-inspired merchandise, which is available not just as a t-shirt and a sweatshirt, but also as a hoodie as well. And beyond that, we've got plenty more. Uh, we've also got our country tea, as you can see here. Then, if you're a GCN club member, you will also receive SOC 16, which is Spanish inspired, with a Spanish flag and the club crest there on the back. Then, we've got our new fan kit with the Spanish flag colours. I'm a particular fan of that one, I have it's to nice. say. I'll just yeah, that I like on it. top. And with that fan kit, you can get the <laughs> casquette, which we've been having here for the whole show, and also uh, these socks. So if any of those take your fancy, fill your boots over at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. Yeah, indeed. And uh, don't forget, as we've said, a lot of riders are going to be using the Vuelta as preparation for the upcoming World Championships. So you probably want to know a little bit more about what's going to go on there. So we sent out local legend and GCN presenter. Well, lo local person. <laughs> yeah, Ollie Bridgewood, and you can find out all about that here.